there you go. So over to you, Sharon, okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Arnold, and Eva as well for this amazing opportunity from the IPBN. Um, <clears throat> I'd be, I'm delighted to be able to talk as part of this particular master series, which I think has been really, really interesting. Some fantastic presentations from Alan, from Goran, from Hillary last week. Um, so before I get into mine, um, I'm going to talk a little bit, if I, if I can, take you back on a little bit of a journey so that you understand um, how what I do impacts on, on scale-ups. So I am a leadership and cultural awareness coach. Oh, sorry, it's not moving. Oh, there we go. Um, and you're probably wondering what's with the typewriter. Um, well, the reason there's a typewriter there is that that's where I started my career. Um, it, Ireland was in recession when I left school. I came from a big family and it was get yourself a job in a, an organization and then from there start building your career and studying at night and that's exactly what I did so I went from typing for people to managing them in a couple of years so it was a pretty interesting journey um, and it's one of the reasons why I chose um, leadership coaching for young or new um, prospective leaders is because of my own journey. And what I discovered is that as somebody who is young and enthusiastic, and so you work hard, you study hard, um, you are very focused on getting things done, um, you're great, you focus on working well with people, you're a team player. And it's those acts of leadership that get you noticed and they get you promoted. But what I quickly found is that when you do get eventually get promoted into a management role, um, it comes with a great pay rise, a company car, but it also came with a black belt in self-doubt. And it's that black belt um, that I like to focus on with, um, with my um, new leaders, because you, uh, I'm a, my original qualification is um, a chartered insurer. And what I very quickly discovered was understanding the complexities of a reinsurance contract does not prepare you as a manager for managing performance, managing people who are older than you, managing your peers, managing people who perhaps are not quite happy with the fact that you got promoted ahead of them. So this is what I like to, this is what I do is focus on helping um, leaders to find what their strengths are so that when they do take on these challenges they're not going to get it all right but they will get a lot of it right and um, because they have the right tools and um, the right approach and the belief in themselves so this is my mission is to accelerate your success as a scale up by empowering your new leaders to step into the leadership roles and thrive so that you can get on with the business of growth and global success so the second part of my um, experience is cultural awareness, cross-cultural communication. Um, because after my experiences in the financial services sector, I decided to leave Ireland and move abroad. And that was the second part of my experience. So when I work with companies, I bring them the um, insight of what it's like to be in a, a new leader and the challenges that they face, but also what the impact of cultural awareness on how we communicate, build trust, and work with clients and with people that we work with. Um, so this is what I do. So I have three programs. One is around leadership. The other one is around cultural uh, diversity and communication. And the last one is around group coaching. Um, So at the core of what I do, it's all about strength-based leadership, leadership. And it's very much starting with, um, the reason I had a very good black belt in self-doubt was I didn't focus on what it was I was good at. All of the things, all of the qualities, all of the competencies that got me from typewriter to company car. And I think that when, you're, when you step into that leadership role, it's really important to focus on what it is that you're good at and develop those skills and to become 
the best version of you, yourself as a leader. So that's basically um, what I focus on. And I think it's really interesting that very often you tr we try to uh, mimic other people. Um, and very that just gets us, um, it, we're not being authentic and we're not being true to who we really are. So part of the work that I do with them is identifying well, what is your leadership style? Who are you as a, as a leader and what, where your strengths lie? Some really interesting research, um, you know, 80% of the work is done by the teams and leaders in an organization. And yet very often people are only using 20% of their strengths because companies, organizations, or the individuals themselves don't take the time out to focus on to figure out what it is that you're really good at and how you can leverage that to move forward. So this is some of the feedback that I get from clients that I work with, how they feel, after um, they've done some of the coaching programs with me. And this is um, a six step that I use just to help explain the process. But I'm not going to go into detail uh, on that today because you can have a look at that later on when, when Arnold sent you this presentation. So let's talk about what's going on in the world of uh, scale ups. Um, I, mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned them, but earlier on in the organization that I worked for, we went through um, three mergers in five years. And scaling up, I think, is a bit like uh, going through a merger as well, because so many things change. When you scale up, um, you reach that inflection point, you can see on the graph, where what has got you to where you are now is not going to get you to where you want to be in the future. There are, yes, there are certain core elements and foundations that will, but a lot of things has to change, including your people, your money, and your model. And Alan spoke a lot about that uh, two weeks ago, and how important it is to um, restructure, um, to develop plans, to look at what your organization is going to be like in the future, even though you're not quite there yet, to have very defined roles and responsibilities. Um, and all of the, the different aspects from a strategic point of view. Um, so you have investors, you know, and despite the fact that a lot of uh, investors use the word angel, <laughs> They're, they, they, they're not Father Christmas, they're not giving things away from free, they're looking for return on their investment. And they're looking for the kick-ass management team to, to give that to them. But behind that amazing management team, there has to be an amazing um, um, leaders um, who, are, and who are going to be working with the teams to deliver the products and services. Um, another aspect is the pandemic, obviously, we were just talking about it beforehand. We all know it's coming. We're going to be going back in some form of or shape of a lockdown. It affects us all. Burnout is huge. People are really unsure and uncertain. But it is also affect how we work and where we work, be it remote, hybrid, face-to-face. -face. It's forcing organizations into the future. It's fast-tracking us to a situation um, that perhaps a lot of us are not prepared for. Um, so this critical inflection point doesn't just impact on the model and the people and the finances, but it also affects the, the people who are in the organization, particularly the people who have founded it, who have been, who've been with it from day one or have joined it in the early phase and have got it to this critical inflection point. They have spent a huge amount of time and effort investing in the relationships in their team and they're really good at what they do and their people really matter to them. But now the next phase involves them stepping away from that. So they're stepping away from the day to day and they're stepping into the future that is yet to come. And that is difficult. It's a change that they want, um, that they really believe in, but it doesn't make it nonetheless difficult. So it's hard for them when their client is refusing to deal with their the person that they have nominated to take over because of that huge bond that they've created very successfully. So there's a lot of things going on in these scale-ups. It's not all plain sailing. Um, obviously then you have these new leaders who are stepping into their roles. I mentioned earlier on, it's 
really difficult to go from being in, well, in the good old days before COVID, going out disco dancing or going to the pub with your friends, and then in a position where you're actually managing their performance. It takes a mindset shift. It takes you, you need to reframe things. And that is a very difficult process. So too is when you're managing people who are older and more experienced than you. Those self-doubts creep in and they will sabotage your performance as a leader. Um, very often you don't want to tell your boss that you're concerned about doing the, the performance review because you've already said, I'm the man for the job or I'm the woman for the job. So how can you go back and tell them that you're unsure? And many people don't. So I want to talk about that later on is how to overcome that. Um, there's new elements as well. Um, decision making, all of a sudden you're turning up at meetings where you're going to be the decision maker and the people around you at the table, how they perceive you. Very often we have these narratives running in our heads as new leaders and we are not the star of the movie. We allow our insecurities to step in and sometimes that means that we don't speak up when we should. So some, I think, um, asked to coach people who, when one of the things that's been said to me is they need to speak up more. But it's not about speaking up, it's about finding the self-confidence and the belief in yourself in order to be able to do that. And also reframing the impact if you don't speak up. Um, cultural awareness, as organizations are scaling up, when you don't even need to scale up in Ireland now or Portugal to have multicultural teams. But it has a huge impact. Goran spoke a lot about this, you know, that there's no longer uh, physical borders. Um, we are now facing a world where there are no borders and remote working allows that to happen. But having lived abroad for many years, um, it's easier, I think, to figure out how things work around here because you're surrounded by it, not just in your daily life, but also in the business world. But when you move into a remote world or into a hybrid world, we don't always pick up on the cultural differences um, and how different, how, how they build trust, how they deal with conflict. So very often being um, a scale up and being working remotely or working hybrid, <coughs> excuse me, we don't always get to understand how culture can impact and also sabotage our work. So these are some of the challenges that scale-ups are facing today. Um, the speed of change, innovation, how do we innovate when, uh, when we're not all together? Um, how, how prioritizing, um, another thing that, because there's so much change going on, people often don't know where to start. Um, and one advice I always give to people is that if you're, if there's a lot of uncertainty, if there's a lot of, um, generally when you're scaling up, resources are stretched. And until such time as you get more resources, you have to be absolutely ruthless about prioritizing. Otherwise people are going to burn out. So it's really, all of these factors impact on your success as a scale up. Um, diversity and inclusion. Um, this is a discussion that, you feel like you don't need to have when you're a scale-up, but when you're a startup, sorry, when you're, uh, you don't need to have when you're a, a startup, but when you're a scale-up, everything changes. And, you know, people say that diversity and inclusion is about being invited to the party and being asked to dance. But for me, diversity and inclusion is being uh, able to change the playlist. That's what it means in an organization, that you feel comfortable enough that you can change the music. Um, Obviously, agility and productivity, uh, particularly in the tech industry, it's how you do business and the agile approach to project management. There's so much to be learned from that. Um, and that idea of just incremental changes and fixes and reacting and moving forward. And there's a lot to be learned in terms of um, management in that approach. But focusing just on results all the time and not the people is not going to help your organization through that critical inflection point because people during times of change and uncertainty which we're now experiencing again with COVID we live this at the moment we're in a constant state of flux and uncertainty so if you want to know what it's like just 
you're already experiencing in your day-to-day -day lives. So the same experiences are going to be happening in your organization as you move on, as you restructure, as you make changes. And there's a couple of key things that we need to do um, in leaders, a couple of um, basics that you need to make sure are happening in your organization, which I will also touch on later on. Um, I think really interesting, um, re retention and talent is a major factor. I was looking, I'm a huge fan of Simon Sinek, I'm sure, you know, and he has this quote about that uh, leaders organize, uh, people leave uh, leaders and not organizations. But recently, Culture Amp did some, a survey of 165 companies. Um, and what the interesting thing that they found out was that, yes, people do leave bosses and leaders, but not, it's not the main reason. And uh, interestingly enough, 12% leave because of a bad manager, 11% leave because the pay is not good enough. 28% leave because of bad leadership, but 52% of your key talent will walk out that door because of lack of developmental opportunities. So going back to my story, I was really lucky because I had a manager who believed in giving people opportunities to develop. And I was doing things that nobody else was doing at the time because I was in a change function. It was all about you had a case file to study, but I wanted to do investigations. I wanted to go out and meet with the clients. I was really enthusiastic. And he didn't say no to me. He said, OK, if you want to do this, let's find a way to make it happen. And that is what needs to be happening with your scale ups. Very often at that critical inflection point, you still have not got a HR or a learning and development function. So it's up to the managers themselves to provide these developmental opportunities for their people. And I'm going to talk about that again. <laughs> OK, so I think, um, as you say in sports, when there's a lot of uncertainty going on, it's time to settle the ball. It's time to focus on what's happening right now. And I think one of the fundamental things to remember, regardless of what kind of an organization you are, regardless of where your people are located, there are certain things that they have in common. And that is that work has to be done. Information has to be exchanged and we have to build on each other's effort. That has not changed. And that has not changed as a scale up or as a startup, as a remote organization, as a hybrid organization. This is what we have to do in order to succeed in our businesses. So what hasn't changed is that leadership is about your people. It always has been and it always will be. It doesn't matter what kind of an organization or what phase you are at. Fundamental human behavior is that I belong, I matter and I feel safe. So how can you help your people to feel that? Leadership skills, um, why we follow leaders does not change. It's harder to, for those behaviors. Um, it's easier in, a, in an office. It's easier when you're face to face with people. Um, but the reason why I believe in you as a leader, the reason why I will do my very best um, for you as a team member has not changed. The role of our leaders has not changed. What has changed is that they have to be a lot more intentional. And Hillary spoke a lot about this last week about intentional leadership. And I want to dig down into that and what that means, because a lot of times we have we talk a lot about these growth mindset, intentional leadership. But what does that mean to me as an individual, as a team member, as a leader, as an organization? What am I going to be hearing as an intentional um, organ leader leader? What am I going to be feeling as um, an intentional team member? What am I going to be doing as an intentional leader? And obviously the high expectation, I think expectations just keep going up and up and up. Um, and it's something that we have to be mindful of. Uh, ben, Bernadette was talking earlier on about, you know, people's stress and anxiety um, in the world at, that we're living, that we're all experiencing shared pandemic. We really have to 
uh, be mindful of what expectations we're setting people. So let's look at what has changed is geography and time zones, the complexity of our work. Um, I think a key thing for um, when you're making a change is leadership communication are really important. But without having that physical presence, um, having that open door or, or across the desk where people can reach out to you, it's very difficult and it's a lot more challenging to show up and guide people through all of this change that you're about to embark on as the scale up. And the critical thing is if you have not built trust and you're not able to deal with the immediate and small problems, how are you going to be able to deal with the larger ones as they come down the road at you? It is so important to spend time on with your people, on your team, helping them to, to get to know you and for you to get to know them. We talk a lot about it, you know, with our products and services, you know, the customers have to know, like and trust you. Well, the same applies to your the people in your organization. It is no different. So working relationships, you know, everybody, <laughs> nobody got this right when we were face to face. Believe me, I certainly did not when I was a young leader. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who put their hands up and say neither did I. So again, it's about being a lot more intentional. It makes it harder. We have to be more strategic about how we engage with people and how we build trust. We're missing a lot of cues. You know, um, it's very easy when you're walking by and you can see from somebody's body language when they're slouching over their desk, you know that something is not right. And you know that maybe you need to take time out and talk to them and see what's going on in your world. When we don't have the people around us and we can't see them, we miss out on a lot. So when we do engage with them and we do talk to them face to face as you go through this um, big change, it's so important to really listen, to understand, to connect and not just go right. Yeah, yeah. OK, you're grand, right. I'm moving on to the next one on one call. That will not be good enough, not during this critical growth phase. So it's incredible, you know, we are designed to connect and communicate with each other. Even small babies um, manage to express their wishes and needs. Um, it is crucial to our survival and it's also crucial and vital for our, the survival of our organization and the success. And yet we rely on means that are a lot less effective. And I'm talking about email or messaging. So, Think about what it is that you want to say. If it's going to have an impact, it's not just saying confirming a meeting, but it's actually talking about a change that's going to impact on people and the work that they're doing and how they prioritize. Then think about how you communicate that message with them. So for me, leadership is three pillars. It's about outcomes, it's about others, your teams, your stakeholders, your clients, and it's also about ourselves. And I, believe, I honestly believe you're not working on yourself as a leader. If you're not doing something that challenges you, it's really easy to forget what it's like to be in their shoes, to put yourself back to what it was like at the very beginning, uh, particularly when you're stepping up into the future, into that strategic role and stepping away from the day-to-day -day business. It's really easy to forget what it's like for the new um, leaders coming behind you who are going to step into your shoes. So be mindful of that. So I often, you know, when I work with um, these leaders, it's about digging down into their world. Um, so what kind of a team do you have? Um, and maybe you were never face to face. Maybe you've only been virtual. So, you know, maybe there is no um, trend. There is no change that you have to actually battle and get used to. And that sense of loss that people often talk about is, oh, you know, people talk about the coffee or the water cooler effect. And it's that moment where you're able to bond with people and form relationships and people miss that. And, you know, but maybe you never had it in the first place because you've always worked um, remotely or you've always. And, you know, how can you improve on that? How can you do better? So what does your team, what does your situation, in, how does that inform how you lead? 
um, how often you communicate, how often you do your one-on-ones, how often you bring your teams together. Um, can you bring them into the office uh, now and again to facilitate that, that, that important bonding? Um, so it's having those conversations and really digging down into, you know, how is this, how is my leadership going? What is it going to look like? What are people going to be saying about it? What am I going to be saying about it? Um, how does distance affect your team in terms of effectiveness? Um, I think one of the big discussions out there is the fact that a lot of people get really, really focused on what they're doing. Um, and it creates a lot of silos and people just think about their own work and they forget about the impact that it has. They forget about the big picture. And for me, particularly during times of change and also COVID and all of the uncertainty, it's so important to give people the big picture all of the time. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is the project that we're working on. This is the impact it has on the organization. If we don't deliver on this, how is it going to impact on the other side of, of the equation? Because it's so easy to go down into our own rabbit hole and forget about everybody else and say, say to yourself, I'm doing a good job. But really, when you don't really understand the role and the impact that you have on the rest of your team members. Um, so really important questions to ask yourself. Uh, so that when you turn up with your team, when you turn up with your peers, um, you are very explicit about what it is that your leadership means to the organization and to your teams. Very often, um, you know, leaders are you're responsible for this and probably a lot more and lots of other things it's impossible to do um, you're responsible for but you're not actually doing but we all have our go-to things that we like to do where we feel oh yeah that's a great day's work i've done a great budget or i've been through that spreadsheet or i've done some coding but it's not actually what your job is really about your job is to make sure these things get done But if you're doing the little things and not focusing on your people, then you're not going to be delivering the product and services that your organization has promised to your investors and to your customers. So one of the key things that people struggle with is delegation because it always felt like I know I did, particularly when we were going through all of the changes, uh, the migration of data, uh, was a huge factor and I hated delegating that so I would often do those do those things myself because I didn't want to be imposing on people and that is not the right approach we spoke earlier on about how um, why people leave organizations and in the absence of a HR department and in the absence of a learning and development um, department how can you as an organization as a leader as a manager find developmental opportunities for your team members how does that happen that means sitting down with them getting to know them finding out what it is that they're passionate about you know maybe they are really into the latest software development things and you're not doing that but it's been done someplace else maybe they are um, and how do you give them that opportunity to work or at least to sit in on those meetings what is it that they want to uh, the opportunities to learn and instead of seeing it as offloading work, it's empowering them. And it's a really different mindset to take. So when you look at what your work, what you're responsible for, it's looking at it through the lens of where are the developmental opportunities here? How can I hold on to these really important people that I'm working with? Because they are critical at this, in, they are critical to our growth, they are critical to our future. Them walking out the door is going to impact, it's going to cost me money. Them walking out the door is going to impact on the morale of my team. And it's going to cost, um, it's going to impact on the delivery of the services and the products that we have to, um, that we want to do to our customers. So it's sitting down. And I, I say to people is sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. And that means spending the time with your individual, finding out where their passions are, giving them those opportunities. I think coming from an organization um, in my past, where everything was very fixed and defined. If you were in claims, you were in claims, you couldn't do anything in underwriting, you couldn't do anything in sales, you couldn't do anything in whatever. 
But nowadays, that has all changed. There's no reason why we have to have, yes, we have to have defined roles and responsibilities, but we can be really recreative in those roles and responsibilities so that you are building on the strengths of your people and not just your leadership strengths, but theirs as well, and giving them those opportunities. Hugely important for that retention piece in your, in your scale up. So this is how you go about it. You, you know, you, you, you sit down with them, you, you be very clear on what's expected, and you make sure you talk to the other people in the organization. It's a great way of creating collaboration across the organization, because it's something that is a huge problem, is the silo effect. So people just focus on what they do and not what other people do. So give them the opportunity um, to experience other parts of the organization and, it's a, and collaborate. Um, it gives them the opportunity to be their best, their best self. So this is a, a, a checklist of what you can go through so, so that you get it right when you're doing this piece if you don't have the support of HR or learning and development. Um, I mentioned earlier on about um, what triggers us and during times of change, uncertainty, um, we are all experiencing it right now. So as a leader, you have to be really, what can you make certain? There's a lot of things we don't have control over, but what do we have control over? What information, giving people the big picture. I think we've seen this play out oh, with COVID over the last uh, two years for, for countries, for governments have failed to give information um, to people. Even if it's bad information, we still need it. Um, if make as things as certain as you possibly can. We've seen it in or in countries where people is one day you have to wear a mask, next day you don't. One day the pubs are open, the next day they're not. The same thing in our organisations. You have to communicate with people, um, make every as as much as possible, make things very clear, so they understand exactly what's going on. <clears throat> Conflict is obviously another um, huge trigger for people and that causes them stress um, and conflict can turn up in as polit political, personal or uh, person uh, personality, political and power. And I would also add in their cultural awareness because cultural differences can cause a lot of conflict. And the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is because this is where people start, you know, when you're scaling up is, does that mean, what, what are the opportunities? What, are, what, what opportunities aren't there? Um, you know, does that mean I need to move? Or nowadays you probably don't have to move with remote working. But what does that mean for me? And it's really important for you as a leader to think about where is the uncertainty in my team? What information do they need? What do we have control over? What do we not have control over? And making things as clear um, as possible for them so that they don't go into that, um, into that stress response. And this, I'm going to explain to you why that's so important. And we often don't think about this, but this is what happens in our bodies when we get stressed. So when we get stressed, it doesn't matter if it's a performance review with somebody you think is more senior than you, or that um, sales have agreed on additional changes to the project and we don't have the resources. It doesn't matter what it is, is it stressing us out? Our uh, stress response system, which goes back to prehistoric man, it will decide, it will say, oh, we are under threat. My job is to protect you. Our brains are constantly scanning to see, are you a threat or am I safe? Am I, do people want me? Um, and if it senses that there's something wrong, <clears throat> what it does is that it cuts off the blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. And it sends the blood to our limbs it cuts off the blood flow to our digestive system. And this is why when people are long-term stressed, they end up with serious problems with their digestive system. Um, and but what we're saying no to is the prefrontal cortex. And this is the executive brain. This is where we build trust. This is where we engage with people. This is where we have to regulate our emotions that we don't fly off the handle. We don't get angry. We don't overreact to people. Um, it's where our communication um, comes from, our ability to um, 
compromise to be able to understand um, okay, this is your perspective and this is my perspective. How can we find a midpoint on this? Um, so when you, you know, the, you see sometimes that people are like, oh, yeah, I like to keep my, my people on their toes and the old fashioned leaders. What they were saying is they would like to keep them in a, in a constant state of stress. And when you're in a constant state of stress, it is impossible to be the best version of yourself. Because all you care about is, do I need to get out of here? Can I make myself small so he doesn't notice I'm around or she? Or do I need to fight? And that is not where your organization is going to thrive if people are in that space. So um, values are hugely important. Our own personal values, what matters to me? I recently was coaching um, a new leader and we did a piece around what his values were. And it, you know, for him was really important was respect, fulfillment, inspiring people and, and personal development. And it just so happened around that time, he was approached by a company and he was offered a 20% pay rise, which is huge money. Um, and he said, Sharon, I thought about it. I spoke to them and I asked them what were the development opportunities in their organization? And they said there were none. It was all about you do the job, you get well paid for it, that's it. So he chose not to take that pay rise because he understood that for him, personal development was really important. And if he did take it, he would eventually be really unhappy. He would prefer to be working with an organization that was going to believe in him, that, that he mattered to them and, and that they were going to develop him um, into uh, the leader that he really wanted to be. Um, but values also affect how we interact, what's important to me. Um, another person I, I worked with, and this is knowing who you are, it's so important. Because I always think that values is it's almost like having um, one of those, you know, when you record music, you have those systems that the, I can't think of the word, the, the desk that allows you to change the volume, to increase the bass, whatever. And understanding what's important to you um, is really important, not just for your own person, but also for others, because it allows you to regulate when you're dealing with people who do not have the same values as you. It allows you to be able to modulate, to connect with them. And you see that happening in culture, you know, uh, particularly around, for example, feedback. Um, uh, in certain cultures, it's perfectly acceptable to say, that's not a good job. Um, I don't like the work that you've done, go and do it again. I like to tell um, a story about my, my poor husband, he's not here on this call, thank goodness, but he's German, we were living in Italy. I was our first um, year married. And it was his birthday. So I bought him a present and I asked him, being typically Irish, because when we give feedback, we kind of like to give it, soften up the feedback so it's not so direct and hard. I asked him, well, what do you think of the present? And he said, uh, I don't like it. So of course, I was horrified and very upset. And I went to my friends and I told them all about my terrible husband. And then I spoke to my German friends and they were like, well, what's the problem? You asked him for the feedback. So, you know, culture affects um, how we do business. It affects what's important to us. And had I not spoken to the others, I would have gone down my, you know, he's, he's not a good husband, blah, blah, blah route. But neither of us were wrong. It's just that feedback is different. It looks different. Um, in our respective cultures. So for him, what was important was being honest about feedback. For me, if coming from an Irish background, what was important is not to offend the person first. And yes, I will give them the feedback, but I will decide, um, it, I will modify it in a way so that I do not have that um, the impact of offending them. But also obviously our company values as well. Um, and scale-ups have this amazing environment where everybody, every, it's all hands on deck, everybody's got everybody's back and it's amazing and we believe in each other and it's that was that has got you to that amazing, that point where it's now time to, to grow and to move on. But sometimes those values aren't, all of them are not suitable. And I think 
Alan referred to this, is you really have to decide is what your future self and organization are going to look like and what will be the values that will sustain that. So the team also has values. Um, and this values is you know, how we do things around here. So as a team, we're setting up the working relationship is really, really important. Assumptions will make a fool of you. Um, as part of my research from when I was um, deciding on, you know, what kind of coaching I was going to do, I'm, I first of all started off with cultural awareness. Um, I interviewed a COO of a big Irish tech company who had worked in Germany. And he um, said they had a huge amount of problems on the project. And the reason being is that even though they, they all spoke English, um, they were all IT or engineering experts, um, they had different ideas around um, time and scheduling and processes. So for the Germans, it was, it was everything was a, um, you know, a process. So you take one step and then you take the next step. For the Irish team, the focus was on results. So they would skip a couple of steps because the outcome, the result would be the same. But for the Germans, that was not how we did business. For them, you weren't doing what you agreed to do and they lost trust and it cost them money and it cost them his job in the end. So do not underestimate the impact of values and how we do things um, in our business, in our teams and also in our personal lives. So obviously I'm a coach and for me, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I'm also a people leader. I hugely believe in people and their ability to um, achieve, but based on the, them and not what other people um, are doing. So this is, I just wanted to share that with you. So as part of this preparation, it actually really got me thinking about, well, how could, what would be a really useful framework for scale-ups? What would be something that they could use with their teams and their leaders to think about, how can I be, an intentional leader moving forward. So I've created this framework for you to take away with you today. Um, and it's really just, how can you do your best too? And I think that is always, it's about your best. It's not about somebody else's best or the boss's best, it's your best. How can you do your best too? And these are all the things that are hugely important. Engagement, building relationships, building trust, supporting others. Um, and I hope you find it useful. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail in it because you can just take it away with you and work on it. If I was working with somebody with, with, a, with a, a client, obviously we would go into uh, more detail so that they would have a very defined action list as to what that looks like, what it feels like, um, and what I will be doing for all of these um, different steps. So, I'm just going to um, finish up now and um, I've given you a couple of top tips um, so for scale ups and one of them is that culture impacts and what best practice looks like feedback communication building trust and um, conflict so be mindful of those inform yourself. I think one of the most important things that COVID has taught us is plan to fail. If X happens, we'll do Y. You've no idea when you're going to be down on a resource. And if you're not planning, um, if you're not looking, what will we do if somebody isn't around because of whatever reason? Um, where else is there um, some opportunity? Where else is there additional resources that maybe we can tap into? Really, really important. Double click on what things mean, like what I've just done there with the intentional leadership. You know, when you talk about growth mindset or accountability in your team, what does that mean? There's a great exercise from a lady called Judith Lazier, and she um, talks about where you literally get people to write. And I'm going to ask you in the now to write three words that um, describe leadership for you. So in the chat, um, I would like you to write three words that describe leadership to you. Okay, you want us to do that now? Yeah. Yeah, you can do it now. In the chat.
Okay, so the next tip is slow down to speed up. I've, I've mentioned that before, get to know your people, build trust, um, find out what it is that they're passionate about, look for opportunities, development opportunities for them um, so that you can retain them. Trust is earned in drops and it's lost in buckets. Really, really important. Um, <clears throat> Plan for decision depletion. And um, this is really interesting. This is a square we make on average 35,000 decisions a day as human beings. So what often happens is during rapid growth is that we're, we are literally back to back in meetings. But every time we turn up at a meeting, we are depleting our ability to make good decisions. Because, you know, think about it, you know, at the beginning of the day, the chocolate bar is over there and you're like, no, no I'm not eating that today. I'll be, no, no, I want to lose weight or I want to live be healthier. But by the end of the day, you're taking off the wrapper. It's because as the day goes on, we are running down our ability to make decisions until we give in. And people often look back and go, why did I agree on that? That was just crazy. We were never ever going to be able to do that. And it's because of decision depletion. So when you're planning your meetings, look at your schedule, look at what's happening, what is really important, where do you need to show up at your best and plan. Do not put back to back meetings in the middle of something that's really, really important. Um, people talk about innovation. I think, you know, if you look at our relationships, if you've been married for many years, you realize the importance of that wonderful honeymoon phase um, that you're going through, which probably Jack is in, <laughs> where everything is fantastic and spontaneous and, you know, you don't need to um, set up um, the, ro the romance in your relationship. But as the years go by, it changes and you actually do have to be intentional in order to create those romantic moments. And it's the same with innovation or organization. That spontaneity that was happening in your scale up around the table, um, in the pub, wherever it was going on, it's still there. The ideas are still there. It's still there with your people, but you have to be a lot more intentional. So create date night for innovation. And when resources are tight, prioritizing is critical. People need stability. They need to know what's going on. They need to know, they need certainty. You cannot keep shifting this, um, the the priorities, it will create a lot of burnout in your team if you continue with that. And make lessons learned part of your, your standard operation procedure. So often, time and time again, I see this cycle of, you know, yeah, yeah, this went wrong, blah, blah, blah. But the next project that comes up, we're not learning from our mistakes. And last but not least, you're not required to set yourself on fire for others to warm themselves. Boundaries are really, really important. We are human beings, not human doings. And particularly during COVID when people are working from home and those, that work, work uh, life balance can, has been dramatically affected for many of us. So we've probably gone way over on my time. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, really, really interesting. Lots of very useful tips, and I can relate to a lot of the things that you said. You know, I think the the, the cultural environment mm. awareness is, is one of the most important thing. Um, so we will take some questions. We have uh, we have time for for a few questions if you have. Anybody? I'm sure. Yeah, Jean. Hello, Sharon. How are you? Hi. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Congratulations for your uh, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, when you speak about cultural um, uh, the, the, the the cultural uh, side of, of, of the 
the people can uh, can have a, a, good, a great impact in the in the companies. For example, how do you see Algarve? Because now Algarve it's a mix of cultural uh, of cultures, and that what I feel sometimes is that mix with my company's culture. Okay, because um, I have um, let's say like this: I have um, Portuguese employees. Uh, from here, okay. I have a lot of of um, of uh, um, sorry uh, clients from different cultures, from different companies, for countries, and uh, sometimes this is not easy to find a, a <clears throat> way to communicate and uh, to to have the right mindset in the employees to communicate with the the clients okay so um how do you see now uh, that uh, this mix of uh, way of thinkings of cultures uh, and all that can uh, how can we should we proceed uh, with the uh, with the uh, in in our companies for example give training in somehow to to our employees to, to deal with different uh, way of thinking because uh, Dutch thinks in a different way from an English or from an Irish or from, you know, and uh, and so it's important to give some uh, some skills, new skills, I think, to, to, to us and to people that work with us uh, to deal with, uh, with uh, these new challenges that uh, they were not used to, uh, definitely. Absolutely. Um, if you want, Joao, well, um, because I'm just conscious we don't have that much time. If you want, we can set up a call for at another time and I can talk to you about that and how you can maybe help okay. your team to understand um, how it impacts on building trust and how we communicate and give feedback. Um, because very often it's been about, first of all, being aware that there are these differences. It's being aware what your expectations are. Um, what matters to you, what's important to you. Um, and understanding that then allows you to be able to navigate and to be able to modulate, to communicate, to connect with people who have different perspectives. Um, and it's all about, it's not about changing who you are. It's just understanding that sometimes you have to modify how you, how you, how you communicate with people, particularly, for example, in the, in the trust building process, you know, for um, certain cultures, it's all about doing. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. If you don't do it when you say you're going to do it, I don't trust you anymore. For other cultures, it's all about getting to know you. It's a very long, slow process. Goran spent a lot of time in China and he spoke a lot about the, you know, the differences there. So it's understanding where differences can come up and then understanding perhaps what your perspective would be. And then that allows you to modify to connect. Um, but I, we, if you want, we can. I can reach out to you after the call um, and talk to you more about it if you're interested in doing something with your people. No problem. I'd be delighted to. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? I, I go. I, I like to extend my, my gratitude to Sharon. I think your presentation was excellent. And uh, I don't have a question for you. I just want to say that I'm, I'm happy that I attended. I also want to thank uh, Arnold and uh, IPBN for having this masterclass. I think this is the last one for this season. So I'm very delighted for what you have accomplished this autumn. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. That's really nice of you to say that. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. I found it very informative and very interesting. I love the part where on your slide is it has to, to know when to coach or motivate. I'm finding with the amount of people I talk to, and I talk to a lot of people outside of the craft sector, to know even when to refer somebody, to speak to somebody else regarding the combination of stressors that is all now incorporated with their business. And it has got so mixed up in some cases that people are very confused as to where, where to go next, what, how to think straight or what to yeah. do. <clears throat> yeah, I think anxiety is a huge thing. And as, in, as leaders, we have a responsibility to our employees. We're like the captains of the ship. You're responsible for all the souls on your boat. And we do have a responsibility to them. 
Um, it's not just about getting results because you will not achieve the results if you're not if your people are not good and not well and don't feel safe and belong and that they matter, then you're going to run into problems. Um, thank you very much. I just I noticed in the chat that if you look at all the different um, you know, with active listening, support, kindness, care, trust, inspiration, mentorship, inspiring, conscious, understanding, respect. Even in this group of people, we all have slightly different variations of what leadership means to you. So um, that exercise of double clicking in your teams, in your organizations, it's getting everybody to have that shared understanding of what this, what does, you know, um, accountability mean? What does leadership mean? And working from there, agreeing on how we move forward as a, as, a, as an organization and as a team so that it's everybody is very clear on what this means. What does engagement mean? What does intentional leadership mean? Um, and it, it just makes it so much easier for people because they need that. They need control. They need certainty and um, they need information. It's really, really important moving forward. So I. Yeah, um, and and there was something. I mean, for me personally, I think you know the most challenge, uh, the, the 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 biggest challenge I would imagine for small companies scaling up is you know a, a lot of them, and especially on in startups, uh, a lot of them are engineer or software developers, and they probably started the company all together, you know, being friends from university, and then at some point when they scale up one of them has to become the leader and yeah. to, 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 tra to do the transition from a member uh, of, of a friend or friends to become a leader and delegate and be the, 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 the authority in a way, uh, I think for me is the biggest challenge of all those small and medium sized companies, you know? Mm, it is quite a challenge, but it's about reframing and it's about looking at what your goals are. Um, and that really helps people. Um, so where we find ourselves in conflict um, like that. So somebody I worked with had that, that very problem. And I, you know, when you say to me, fast forward five years, where do you want to be? What is it, what is it that you want for, in your life, for your family? And they want to be successful. They want to have financial reward. And all of a sudden it makes it easier to make that transition um, because you have stepped into the future and you've looked at where it is that you want to end up and not just focusing on the present moment. Yes, it is difficult. It's a difficult transition to make, but you can do it. And when you do it in a respectful um, yeah. and trust, you know, that you, you take them with you um, and how you build on, on your relationship. Um, most people can make the transition, but they just need a little bit of adjustment here and there. And there will probably be a, a leader with naturally born leaders, you know, there are people who can fit in, in, in the job and in the position very, very easily. Others, mm -hmm. others is more, more difficult. I think that one of the things that I do with my coaching is that to find out what kind of a leader people you are. Are you a people leader? Are you a change leader? Are you an innovation leader? Are you a results leader? Are you an operational leader? What it is that you love doing? Because organizations need, we don't need all engineers because you need people who are also good at other things um, and that's really important if everybody's like you you're not going to have innovation you know we, we need that diversity in your organizations but also is leading from a place of strength and yeah. um, it's really really important and your leaders will be exceptional when they do that and they're not leading they're not all tied up they're not trying to be something that they are not I don't have um, a particular question, Sharon, but I'd just like to say that was a really interesting talk. And thank you. I thought it was, for me, particularly interesting because I worked for years in a kitchen. And in that environment, everybody is together in one room for the whole day. And, you know, your boss is there, he's cooking with you, and your commie chefs are below you, and you're cooking with them. And everybody, at a glance can see exactly what's going on and in that way it's going to be very different for me as I move into kind of online work and getting a, a whole picture of what's going on and communication might be all new for me I'm going to have to um this is a new challenge I didn't really even think about but as you were mentioning it I said oh yeah 
this is very different from the environment that I uh, learned in. So um, yeah, it's uh, it was really useful for me to consider all this. Um, another thing about, you know, just how to get everybody on the same page, because again, with the kitchen, you can go out after work, everyone goes for a drink together and you're all, you feel like a family, you know, and our goals yeah. are to get the food out um, as quickly as possible with as little waste as possible. And everybody is working together on the same thing. But I think on, in a bigger organization as well, everybody will have different goals and different things they're working on. Um, so, yeah. Um, do you have any advice for how to get how to communicate more effectively in a kind of an online remote working scenario? That, that's my question. Yeah, I, I think um, often and frequent, it's building, building the relationship. It's a, that intentional piece, what it is that you mm. want to achieve. If you want to achieve trust, what are the things, that, how do you build trust with people? And it's about talking to people, having conversations, you know, particularly um, like, like this, you know, afterwards, you'd want to reach out to somebody in the group, because this is a little bit more passive, shall we say, you're listening to what I'm saying. Mm. Um, and when you turn up at a meeting, most of the time, some one or two people are speaking, and you're not. And how do you become part of that team, unless you actually do what you do? It's like, you know, the pub, it's that virtual coffee that will help you to build um, relationships with people. It's that being intentional. It's making time to invest in the relationships because without them you cannot solve problems together mm -hmm. so if you don't have the foundation there it just feels a lot more um slightly unnatural shall we say because it's as human beings it's not what we're we're not designed to you know this is not our natural environment mm -hmm. um it's our reality and we have to adapt to it and that means being a lot more intentional, making time. It's not like you're walking past the person and you go, oh, you know, we met the other day in that meeting or you, I saw you were at the same meeting and, you know, maybe you'd like to get a coffee sometime. I'd love to talk to you about, you know, where you're from, what you're interested in. You can't do that anymore. So it is about sending messages to people saying, listen, I'm new to the team. I'd love to, you know, to have a chat with you just to connect. It's being intentional about building relationships. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I think I think well I think that that there will be no uh, unless yes. anybody has another question. But I think that's that's we're just over an hour. So yes, this is going. This is the last um, of our masterclass this year. But we will have more uh, next year in January, February. Uh, we still have two events this year. So one is our first conference in Porto. Um, it won't be streamlined live, but we will record it. And for the people who, are, because I know some, some of well, some of them are in the Algarve, others are in Ireland. Uh, Chris, you are in Porto, and you will join us. But for the others, we'll record it and we'll uh, we'll share it on the YouTube channel. And then we have for the people in the Algarve, we have one more event which I think will be really interesting with the Nest, the Innovation Center for Tourism, at the Faculty of Economy. Um, at the University of Algarve in Faro, that's on next, no, uh, in two weeks on December the 9th, and we'll announce it. I think it's already on the website, but we'll announce it uh, this week and next week. Yeah. Okay, so thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Sharon, very much for the preparation and the thank great. You. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Joao, we can connect afterwards. And I, okay. if, I can, if I can, I might actually go down to the Algarve um, in two weeks' time, but maybe see you there. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll be there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ciao.